And why, I think, actually stand-up gets right to the heart of something quite important. Or at least the way I do it. I'm going to start then with an experiment. Turn your eyes into your head and have a look in that space, that space that Aristotle actually called the mind. What do you see? I don't know. But maybe you see what I see, a hubbub of ideas fizzing around. First and foremost, there are those vivid, lively ones, the ones that are always scheming, the ones that feel like they're being punched in from outside. We usually call them reality. And then there are those powerful, passionate, intense ones, the ones that can gather us up and force us on or hold us back. Our emotions that are strangely sticky, that catch us up in other people's lives. And between them, a whole galaxy of different thoughts, beliefs, hopes and dreams. Some like black holes, vortexes, sucking others within them. Others like white holes, throwing out truths. Others merely like crystals trying to force order in the chaos. And so the big problem, I always think, of philosophy is how do you understand that? How do you relate to living in a mind that is always already thinking? I get the phrase from Heidegger, because Heidegger is the king of that idea. The idea that you don't own your mind, that you're not the only thing thinking it, that somehow there are other thoughts also there and existing is reconciling yourself with them. So how do you do it? Well, again, if you follow Heidegger, he will say the only real way you can do it is to go back into the history of philosophy, to look at ideas like the idea of idea, the concept of concept, the idea of the mind or freedom, in the moment of their creation, to feel the joy of that creation again, to see its nuance, because in its nuance, you get to rethink who you are. And that is partly why I do history. But there's another reason. And here I am with Foucault. Foucault will say in almost the last thing he writes that all his life he's wanted to think the history that is silently thinking him. The ideas that are thousands of years old in whose life we live, whom, in whom we still have a part. And therefore, in hearing ideas from the past, in knowing where they went, in hearing them and disagreeing with them, and yet hearing them as they are. I hope, I hope you also hear the history. You hear where you are in relation to them. And finally, for me, to present philosophy as history, to prevent it as stand-up, is to be caught up in an idea, perhaps of Deleuze, and a bit of me. Deleuze will say, Philosophy is not about solutions, it's about questions. Epochs are defined by questions. Individual philosophers then just give you partial answers as to questions that are eternal. And I think I might add that for me also philosophy is about not just questions that are imminent, that dwell within the world, but transcendental answers. Answers that have been the answers to so many questions over the years. Answers like, because it's your boy, or it's a girl thing, or left and right. Transcendental answers then that have found so many questions. And if you hear those questions and those answers pulled apart, you hear something about the nature of thought. It doesn't need to resolve things. It can have answers that don't have questions. It can have questions that don't have answers. And that's the point. And that for me is the point of philosophy. It gives you that idea. It gives you that freedom. Which is why that other approach, the one that likes to have nice little discussions, is so very bad. It breeds too easy accommodations between questions and their answers. And easy accommodations are very, for me anyway, suspect. You see, if you privilege answers, everything becomes certain. You become a possible of the free market or communist utopia or God save us family values. And everything becomes resolved into single solutions. <laughs> or else, even worse. You have a habit of resolving everything into neat little discussion programs. You privilege questions. Questions that cannot be answered. Questions that are just like chicken and egg. That are really designed just to make journalists or pundits or politicians look so clever in the answering. Questions then, and answers, that are for me not just anodyne, but the antidote to thought. So if you ask me, why do I stand up philosophy? 
for philosophy. Why do I do the history of philosophy? It is because only in that history do we start to really tread that thought that is so hard to think. The thought that leads to true human freedom and beyond that, perhaps, beatitude.